shock the system. Welcome to Dank Discussions with your host, Calican CEO, Maynard Breslow. In each episode, you'll learn from the trailblazers, leaders, entrepreneurs, and influencers in the ever-moving, ever-growing cannabis industry. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Dank Discussions. Today, we're joined by Scott McDowell. Scott is the founder of Blue Mary Jane Global Cannabis News. Uh, they have product reviews, creative spotlights, a lot of cool content on there. And uh, excited to talk about that and a lot more that you've got going on. So uh, thanks for joining us today, Scott. Yeah, no doubt, man. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, tell you about my 15-year journey um, in uh, media and entertainment to kind of get where I'm at. It's been a it. wild ride. You know, it's, it's great, too. I'm so grateful to have you on because, first of all, you know, uh, you know, obviously we're in the cannabis industry and that's already tough enough. Right. And I know right now you're in the middle of moving and that's like the worst shit, you know, so I'm really grateful for your time. I'm really grateful for coming on and uh, enjoying us today for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Likewise, man. I'm a, uh, I'm definitely always interested to tell my story. Like I said, it's been a wild ride. So for definitely sure. uh, kind of share any of my insight that can help anybody kind of weather the storms that I've weathered and kind of, uh, you know, Le- leverage relationships and navigate through it's it's been a fun it's been fun and i'm excited for what's happening in 2021 already we're only 24 days in that's it that's it so cool like i would say let's t- it's gonna start off uh easy right so let our listeners know where you're based out of today i know you're moving but where you got where are you based out of now and where are you going oh uh, yeah so right now i'm just like right outside of downtown denver um gonna be going up uh kind of towards the boulder area staying for the um for a little bit and looking to probably relocate to southern california um hopefully later 2021 like the west side santa monica culver city area um ideally amazing yeah, san know. diego's on the radar a little bit but i need well, a san big Diego's city. kind of up and coming actually you know so yeah, yeah i lived there for i was there for like a month once and it was a lot of fun i i kind of uh kind of enjoy but i need like i need some city so i need to still be like you know being close to la without being in la would mm-hmm. you know kind of be helpful for business la is big that's where i'm from so it's funny right denver kind of seems to be this obviously uh, the modern uh you know regulated uh cannabis industry that's like the epicenter right that's like the ground zero i'm from la so i have something to say about that because we've been doing it for a long time as well you know but you guys became legal uh, before us, you know, so, but not only that, but you, you know, you have experience, you know, doing media for a long time, you know, so I'd love to hear, you know, taking all the way back, you know, tell me about your journey in cannabis, pre everything, you know, 15 years of media, talk to me about that, and kind of how you led up now, you know, to, uh, to Blue Mary Jane. Yeah, I guess my first, I guess I kind of, first time I, I kind of like, bring it back full circle, but my first time smoking weed, I guess, was like, probably my senior year of high school with one of my lacrosse teammates. And um, I was like, damn, this is a really good feeling. And then, uh, so I smoked weed, um, you know, pretty much that summer a little bit. And then I got to college and one of my, like, the guys who lived, the guy who lived across the hall from me, like sold weed. And I would like, I, you know, I played lacrosse. So I like, and I was always like out. So I was like helping him sell his weed. So I would like pinch a little bit off the bag and, you know, like sell it and, He's, he was like, I know you're pinching weed, but like, I don't care as long as you're giving me my money. So, so then eventually, <laughs> so then eventually, all the weed I was pinching, I started like selling that because he was like making. He was he was giving fat ass sacks. He would probably give like nine gram quarters, or you know, I guess it's not a quarter. He would give nine grams for you know like what a quarter would cost. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so yes, yeah, so I was just kind of uh, you know building my little clientele and really just getting weed to smoke for myself. And that was really what it was more about, just you know, smoke, give, having weed to smoke for myself and. Um, long story short, it didn't work out for me in college. I was kind of a little hothead. I mean, I'm still kind of a hothead, but being on the lacrosse team, I had a lot of success um, in high school and got a lot of press, um, just like interviews. And my high school team was really successful. We won the state championship and sent kids to all the top um, lacrosse programs. So <clears throat> I thought I was a little uh, ahead of myself, um, you know, getting uh, getting to school. But, but yeah, so after uh, things didn't work out at college, I wound up getting a job at a, at a newspaper. It was the new daily newspaper in Baltimore called the Baltimore Examiner. And I was handling the the retail advertising for the Baltimore Examiner, which, you know, was like bars, restaurants, and, um, you know, small type of businesses. My family, my aunt and uncle um, owned a hardware store that my uncle worked at for like 30 years. And then the guy he worked for retired. So he sold him, they sold him the business. And 
they, uh, so I've been around like small business pretty much my whole life. My aunt worked at a, you know, a really famous photographer, Morton Tatter. And I was always around that studio and I was, you know, hanging out with her and, and visiting the, you know, the studio. And then she left there to help my uncle run the, uh, the hardware store. So I was uh, always, always around small business. So I would, had a really, um, I remember one of my, uh, bosses at the newspaper, we had a meeting with this, like, it was like a fish and tackle store that was around for like, I don't know, a hundred plus years and nobody could ever sell them advertising. But since like they knew me from, you know, I was really young, they, you know, they gave me the meeting and they bought the advertising. The boss was like really impressed with that. So it was really about relationships and that, you know, I kind of hit a ceiling um, when I was at the examiner selling advertising and I was like, this is cool. I was making a ton of money for like, you know, 21 year old kid. I was like, you know, I'm fucking renting out booze cruises for all my friends, renting limos. Like I thought it was like raining money. I thought, you know, my little 60 grand was like, you know, I thought I was a millionaire. <laughs> I was like, I was blowing through money every weekend, like crazy. It was just so stupid. <laughs> but when you're, I, I mean, that. when you're that age, that's, that's, uh, that's <coughs> age, right. You know what I mean? I mean, for, for that, for that time, some people flipping burgers or whatever, you know, and you're over here got a, uh, got a little bit of expendable income already at that age, you know? So. It's crazy. I was, I thought I was, I thought it was never, I thought it was just, it was so stupid. Everyone tried to, my aunt and uncle tried to tell me to save money, save money. I never listened to them. And uh, I was, I, I got in a little bit of trouble. I wound up like getting in a couple bar fights and got arrested. And uh, yeah, so I was like, man, this is fucking Baltimore. I'm fucking, I know everybody here. I need to get the fuck out of here. Like this shit is like, I'm over. I don't want to get arrested for like, like somebody like trying to have beef with me for fucking have to punch him in the face. And I'm the one going to jail for fucking breaking their nose. Cause they stepped to me. But anyway, um, so my, but one of my really close friends, he got a job in Florida as like a sushi chef. Like my one of my, like literally my best friend, Sal, I'm still talking. It sucks. I don't talk to him as much as you know we used to when we were you know back home. But so he got a job down there. I was like, you know, Tampa sounds cool. Not really knowing the, like the geographic uh, location of Tampa. It was more of like, you know, just me wanting to to go to Florida. I thought for everywhere in Florida was the beach and come to find out Tampa is an hour from the beach. So I moved there. Um, I wound up getting a job with a CBS sports radio. And I was going to, I was, was selling advertising for them for three of their shows. It was called uh, on deck with the devil rays um, girls gone sports and the sports explosion. So I sold uh, advertising for those three shows and I was setting up live remotes. So basically it would be like a, you know, a radio station coming out to, you know, to set up a, uh, you know, a live broadcast at an event. <clears throat> so I wound up setting up um, a live event for this. Uh, it was a dragon. Do you know what dragon boats are? Have you ever seen those? Like uh -huh. a dragon boat race? And there's just like these ancient um, um, Asian style boats with that are like kind of like styled like a dragon. And um, anyway, so I set up a live, a live remote broadcast on this like yacht that was like a charter yacht so we were basically trying to promote this charter yacht that happened to be in the marina where the dragon boat races were so we set up this live remote on this boat and um yeah so but the night before i went out me and my buddy we got a fucking we bought like a whole you know we thought we were balling so we bought a whole bottle it was just me and him we didn't know anybody there so we were trying to make friends and so anyway, nobody, it was like kind of a dead night. $250 so, bottles or something like that? Yeah, exactly. I don't think it was that much, but something like that. It was Tampa. So it was actually, this was actually in St. Petersburg. So it was a little bit outside. It was more towards the beach. And um, he fucking passes. It was like dead. So like nobody was there at the club. And some people were there, but it wasn't like a pop at night. So he passes out the fucking table. I fucking drink most of the bottle and I'm fucking wrecked out of my mind. I was a club promoter, like, you know, throughout college. And even when I worked at the examiner, like I was like in the club scene. So I, <clears throat> I kind of knew my way around that world. So um, long story short, we wound up leaving the club and I, uh, I see like a, at the Marina, I see like a party happening on this boat. I'm like, yo, I'm going on this fucking party boat. You coming? He's all fucked up. He doesn't know what's going on. I take off all my, I see people like jumping in the water, skinny dipping. So I fucking rip off all my fucking clothes. I, uh, I'm naked at this point. I jump in the, off the fucking thing into the water and there's all this coral reef that I fucking land onto and all this shit slices and dices Holy me all up, dude. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, no dude, way. I, yeah, dude, this gets crazy from here. So somebody finds it funny to like take my clothes and throw them in the fucking water after I do this. Oh. So now, now I'm get out, I crawl out on the, uh, on the edge of the pier. And I'm like, literally like gushing blood. My foot got sliced up really bad. Uh. I think I have like, 
I have uh, all kind of shit all in me, like coral reef shells that needed to be plucked out. But my buddy's like, oh, I'm going to go get the car. I'm going to go get the car. I'm like literally holding my fucking junk, like just, you know, like fucking scoured up, like so <laughs> trying to hold my shit, like freezing cold at this point. He's trying to go get the car. I don't know. I, I don't know how long I waited there, but I never, uh, I never, he never came back with the car. So I was like, fuck this. I'm leaving. I'm going to go. I know where the car is. So I was like, I got to the car, but I literally, I'm naked. So I'm like walking around St. Pete holding my fucking dick, like, you know, <clears throat> and just fucking bleeding everywhere. Um, I think I, uh, I wound up like seeing a towel in the back of a pickup truck. So I grabbed the towel and like wrapped myself in this towel. And I told somebody that I got robbed <laughs> and uh, can I use your phone, please? And they let me use their phone. And uh, there's like no taxis. So anyway, I wound up sleeping next to the car, like next to this house where the car was parked. My, I mean, you, huh? you get some clothes and you're still bleeding. Like <laughs> I just got a towel. I just, I mean, I just wrapped myself up in a towel. Oh gosh, yeah. And I was wasted out of my mind. Like I don't think I've ever been that. I mean, I've probably been that drunk, but I was really <laughs> drunk. <laughs> but um, but yeah. So I just like fuck it. I'm gonna crash here. I don't know. Whatever time the sun comes up, five a.m., six a.m. I'm like, you know, I'm like, all right, let's get it. Somebody's gonna be out now help me get it fuck get to back to tampa so um so yeah so i find somebody let me use their phone i call a cab i have money where i you know at the house so i pay for the cab and i have to go to uh my never my friend i don't know i think i lost my friend for like a couple days at least like a few days before i heard from him again um but uh but yeah so long story short the next day was this dragon boat races on this live broadcast so I wound up showing up late to this live broadcast in a wheelchair because I'm like all fucking banged up. And um, the guys who are like the hosts of the radio show, they uh, they stop like mid show. And they're like, oh, shit, our sales guy's here. Um, I don't know what happened to him. Let's bring him over here and like, let's let's talk about what happened. So they brought me on the radio show and I told him the story that I just told you. But, you know, a lot more. Yeah, it's probably a lot more juicy because it was pretty fresh. And, you know, they were asking a lot of like detailed questions. So long story short, people were calling in and people were like, you know, they were like, they liked the, they liked the story. So they started to send me out on like, um, you know, covering events. I would be like, you know, go out with the camera nice. guy. So I was like, I be, I went from a salesperson to like an on-air host. So I was like a person. Yes. Yeah, so I was like a personality for, uh, for the sports explosion, CBS sports radio. And I wound up going to this uh, one event called the hot import nights. It's like a, car show model competition and concert kind of all packaged together and they go to like big stadiums all over the country it's like 18 cities um it's i think it still goes on now it's the, the ownership has changed a few times but it's a tour um car fashion um and so i wound up um they send me out to uh to where the fuck was it at it was like the uh the devil ray stadium or something like that yeah it was the devil ray stadium it was outside in the parking lot they take over the whole parking lot and do this huge festival and car competition so i was there like just interviewing people interviewing the um you know the car car guys and interviewing um you know some of the artists that were performing and as i was done i had all access passes so i was like fuck this is this is cool. I want to fucking, I'm going backstage. I'm going to see what's going on back here. What's up? So I have my little backpack. I got some weed. I got my fucking bottle of alcohol with me. I'm just fucking drinking from the bottle, smoking weed like by myself. Cause the camera guys are like, you know, 40, 50 years old. They're like, you know, they're not about that life. <clears throat> so, so yeah. So all these people are like, who the fuck is this guy back here drinking fucking bottle and smoking weed everywhere? Who the fuck does he think he is? So like everybody said, you know, they were like, you know, real cool. And like, they were just asking me questions. And I wound up connecting with a uh, DJ Rocky rock who was at the time he was the main stage DJ. And um, he was a D also the DJ for the black eyed peas on their album monkey business. He DJed a um, bunch of stuff um, with the black eyed peas. And I think he was the first DJ for like a, uh, guitar i think it was guitar center where he won a guitar he, i mean he's a really he was i mean he's obviously still is a really accomplished dj so he and i were you know really clicked and um he was like yo uh i was telling him about the live remotes and that's you know that's really i made a lot of my money selling live remotes um it was almost the same as like booking a dj for a show and he's like yo we should set up some after parties for this tour I'm like, yeah, that's a good idea. Cause it's like the same thing as like booking a DJ for booking a radio show. Like, you know, it's the same kind of, it's almost the same price too. And um, so I was like, damn, there's an opportunity here. So we decided to put together official after parties for this tour. So I wound up going on tour. I quit my job at the fucking radio station and I wound up going on, I like 
went on the rest of the hot and port nights tours with dj rocky rock and like every two weeks it was moved to a different city so it was like 18 cities i mean at the time it was like yeah it was great it was how like old are you at eight, the time here how old was i um it's like mid 20s probably it was, Man, it was, it was amazing, yeah it was like what is, you know like going around on tour it was insane i had no business like doing this shit but these after parties hit some of them sucked some of them but some most of them hit and uh so we had the official after party for this tour because there was no after party. So all the models, all the car competition, all the artists, everybody would come into these after parties that I was hosting with DJ Rocky Rock. And um, so I was hosting and then he was DJing and then uh, we would sell tickets and tables. And so I was making more money, you know, putting these events together than I was uh, selling advertising and like being a radio personality. So I was like, fuck this. But then the tour ended. <clears throat> so I was like, what the fuck am I going to do now? This is like, the well is dry for, you know, for like a year or whenever the tour was coming back around. So I was trying to figure out what I was going to do at the time. Uh, there was a couple artists, Colby O'Donnell. I don't know if you know him. He was signed to Akon. He, he was on a record with Lady Gaga called uh, Just Dance, which was like a pretty big oh, yeah. Lady Gaga record. Wow. That was nice. Yeah. So he was nominated for a Grammy. Um, there's another guy, Quest. Um, Quest Cross, who was on the Hot and Poor Nights tour as well. So I connected with these artists um, pretty closely. They were like affiliates of Akon. They weren't like signed to him. But then uh, what happened was um, I was started like co-managing Quest and um, working real close with Kobe's father, um, Freddie, who uh, rests in peace. But yeah, he um, I was like co-managing these artists who I like, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. But, um, you know, I had sales background. I had a uh, you know, marketing background from doing these events. So they trusted me to kind of, you know, figure out my way through. And I did. We had some pretty good runs. And I kind of was doing a lot of work um, that I wasn't being compensated for, I felt like. So I was, in a, I was living in L.A. I moved actually from well, – I was on tour for, I don't know, a year and a half. So I didn't live anywhere. I was, lived on the road. And then um, as the tour was over, I moved – well, I went from Tampa to the road and then I went from the road to see, I was in San Diego for a month. And then I was like, I thought I didn't realize how far San Diego was from LA. So I was like, I gotta be in LA, all the businesses in LA. So I moved to up to like right next to the Hollywood bowl. I lived in this really dope condo. And uh, yeah, so I was doing a lot of fucking work that I wasn't being compensated for. So I wound up uh, more or less, um, you know, con- the long story short is convict, there's two companies at Acon Zone. One is Convict Music and one is Con Live. Convict Music is the production house under Universal and Con Live is the, is the distribution under Interscope. Con Live got like $8 million for four artists, supposed to be $2 million for Acon, $2 million for Lady Gaga, $2 million for uh, Cardinal Official and $2 million for, I think it was Colby. Um, I was supposed to get some of that money, but the money, I thought I was going to be getting a huge raise when I, but I worked under the convict umbrella. So I didn't work under con live. So um, I thought I was going to be getting a huge raise. And I was like, you know, really excited that uh, I was finally going to be getting the money that I deserved. And that shit, it wasn't the case. I went and met with like, you know, the executive, you know, boo and other guys like, you know, quest, um, um, Brian Wakefield, like all these guys that were, you know, like that I were like my direct contacts. I really didn't communicate with Akon. My main point of contact was the CEO of the label, Melvin Brown, who um, Melvin Brown kind of like put Akon on. His, I think his, I think his uncle was Johnny Wright, who was a really powerhouse. Uh, he, I think he managed a bunch of like the, the boy bands and stuff, but did like their merchandise and things like that. But so I didn't really work with Akon and Akon was kind of the one, you know, spending all the money. So I was like, you know, fuck this. I don't need this shit anymore. I was like super butthurt. I was like, um, yeah, so I was like moved. Actually, we went to New York. This is even more crazy. I forgot this part of the story. I don't, I skipped this a lot. So originally when all this was happening, we went to a, a photo shoot for Vibe magazine. It was like their the 10 year anniversary for uh, academics clothing. I don't know. You ever heard of academics? Do you remember that brand? Yeah. yeah. AKA, AKA, right? Academics. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so it was like their 10 year anniversary and we went for a photo shoot and I was like into this chick that was living there. I was like, really? Um, she was on a, She was like a singer that was on a song with one of the artists on the label. And so I was like always talking to her and I was like, you know what? We went, we went for the weekend and I like wound up like staying with that girl for a couple months and wound up like getting my own place in New York. So I wound up never going back to LA um, after that photo shoot so, or like unless to get my shit and move. But, but yeah, so I moved to New York um, 
you know, and then I was like, you know, fuck all this convict shit. Like, I don't need, you know, I don't need this label. I have all the, I, I literally know everybody that I needed to know. Like they told you, to you the, told me they weren't even paying you, right? Like you were doing a bunch of shit. They weren't even giving you money for. I mean, I was, I was getting paid, but I wasn't being compensated for like this type of work I was doing. Like I was yeah, doing yeah. like high level work and I was being paid, you know, I wasn't being paid fairly. I mean, I was, I was driving around a fucking Benz. I was living in the fucking Hollywood Hills. So I was straight, but I was just, I, I felt like I was doing a lot of work um, yeah. that I wasn't being paid. But I mean, I'm from the inner city of Baltimore. So like even to have a fucking Benz and have a you know condo in the Hollywood Hills, it was fucking sick, but I wanted more because I felt like I was, I deserved it. I, I mean, I'm, you know, I was grinding, but, um, but yeah, so I moved to New York and like wound up getting a job with this booking agency called central entertainment group. And at the time uh, they, they, they represented the Jersey shore. <clears throat> so um, I was booking like, yeah, like Pauly D. All the dudes uh, from the Jersey Shore. <laughs> yeah. So they, they were the first agency to represent these guys. So they were getting paid $30,000 in appearance at the time. I don't know what they eventually got to, wow. but that was at that time. And then, um, yes, yeah, so I was doing a lot individually. of... Individually. Individually. <laughs> I was like, I don't even feel comfortable booking these people. Like, what are they going to do? Are they going to do magic tricks? They're going to show up with fucking lions and tigers? Like... What the fuck are they? They're, they're gonna show. But at the they time, their abs. You know, they show the abs and they do the fist pump. You know, that's about. You know, I am BDI, which like I don't know. I don't know how serious to take that, but it's a, it's an it's an internet movie database, which like they have an algorithm with which ranks your celebrity. And at the time, they had a higher celebrity rating than Will Smith. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> but I that's. Mean, I mean, they were they were like uh, at the time, dude. They were like the uh, the talk of everything. You know what I mean? Like. I mean, think about how much money they made at one time and how much money was made off of them, you know, and series and shows and, you know, right. uh, everything along with it. It's yeah, so I did that for a little bit. And then I was like dating one of the girls in the office and it was just not kosher, <laughs> I guess is the best way to put it. So I was like, you know what? <laughs> Fuck this. I'm out. And uh, like, I didn't need, I don't need to, like, I'm, why am I splitting? I was splitting like a 15% commission with the agency. And I was doing, I was doing all the bookings. Like, why the fuck am I going to, but you know, I had to, I was running everything under their license and like their um, uh, liability, like all that kind of stuff. So that was why I was splitting this, you know, seven, I was splitting half the you know commission with them for the bookings that I was doing. You know, it wasn't just the Jersey Shore. It was a ton of like celebrities and DJs. And so I, but I, I, I didn't need them. So what I did actually, I started a, we started this company um, called Global Attack Mixtapes. At the time, mixtapes were like fucking hot. Like, oh, bro. you know, in New York, mixtapes were like, you know, they were it. So, they, you know, DJ Drama. I think the feds like prosecuted DJ Drama for like DJ his Clue. Mixtape. I remember like, yeah. I mean, all these dudes, man, like the mixtape. So, so I had a concept to put together um, a mixtape where we would curate artists from all over the world and have like these different compilations. It was called the Global Attack Mixtapes. You can still find it on Spotify now, iTunes, all that. Uh, we had like Styles P, Jada Kiss, Freeway, Tretch from Naughty by Nature, a um, bunch of uh, international artists that um, I'm probably forgetting. But uh, we, I think we put out, I think there's probably three to five uh, of the mixtapes. Yeah, Global Attack mixtapes. Um, well, just put Global Attack mixtapes iTunes and you should, it should pop right up. Global yeah, there's the mixtape series volume one. <laughs> yeah. So we, uh, we did that for a little while. It was cool. Got a little bit of traction. I actually met with Kay Slay. I don't know if you ever heard of the dr- Kay yeah. Slay, the drama king. Uh, I was going to get him to host it, but he was just, I didn't like his fucking attitude um, when I went and met with him. So I said, you know, no. But um, but yeah, so I did that. And then it was like the mixtape scene. I was I was charging artists to uh, to be featured on the mixtapes. And what we would do is we would, you know, share do a, like a royalty split. And then we would also um, feature them on different media outlets. So I had a internationalhiphop.com which was a website that I started and uh, you know, it turned in, we were getting tons and tons of traffic and that was kind of like the backbone of all the marketing efforts for global attack mixtapes. And, you know, we had some, you know, uh, let's see, who do we have? I'm looking at the iTunes page now. Are you on the iTunes page? Oh no, I'm on the, uh, the Spotify page, but yeah, same thing. I'm sure. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, you see some of the features, like how it worked is like those artists that, you know, let's say they have a feature from Jadakiss or Styles P the artists that are like the main artists on the track, Mm -hmm. they probably paid for that feature and they have the rights to the song. So then they take that song to me and then they would say, Hey, look, I have this feature from Jadakiss. 
can you help me market it? So that's what we came up with these mixtapes and the website. I wound up selling the website. I, um, I signed to NDA, but I can't say who I sold it to, but I wound up selling internationalhiphop.com to like a large um, media player in New York. You can probably figure out who they are. But, um, but yeah, so we sold the website and I was like, you know, what am I going to do from here? And uh, I wound up at the time working a, a lot of times with a, with a Bad Boy Studio. It's called Daddy's House. So a lot of the tracks we would send over there, I was working with one of the engineers, Flames Flow, and he was like mixing down a lot of the records. And I was like, you know, we should actually, you know, aside from the website, we should also maybe do like an online radio show for the artists. We'll bring them on this online radio show. It'll be another way to promote the mixtapes and promote the artists. They'll be happy um, with, you know, the promotion we're providing them. So I started the X101 Jams out of uh, Daddy's House, which was, you know, Puff Daddy's recording studio. It was in Times Square. We're off of Times Square. And um, so, yeah, we did that. And I couldn't afford to, uh, like, broadcast from the studio all the time. So I would go out to, like, live events because I didn't have any sponsors at the time. So I, I you know, paying out of pocket for the studio. Um, but it was, like, the perception was amazing. Like, all these fucking Biggie Smalls plaques, like, fucking total, all these records. Like, you know, we have all this content from being around all this shit. Diddy didn't have any – he had literally nothing to do with it. I was just renting studio time. But, you know, people – people assume that since we're doing it at his studio that he's involved. And I know we never said he was involved, but a lot of people made that assumption just because they're fucking stupid, but it helped me. It, it was in my benefit, I guess. Right. Like, um, And let them fill in the blanks. You know? Right. So I wound up going out to covering an event um, at this art gallery in uh, in lower Manhattan called uh, gallery 69 um, graffiti art, New York. The guy, Steve Cornell, represented a ton of like pioneer graffiti artists from the 70s and the 80s that are like you know documented in history books as like the godfathers of graffiti like cost or not cost i'm looking at the cost behind me tacky 183 um you know nick 707 lava um futura futura is actually how steve got into art he his family has owned art galleries for you know 50 his whole life he's like i guess he's probably almost 60 now so his family owned art galleries on like park avenue like really fine art and then he brokered a or he sold he bought and flipped a, a futura and um he wound up uh, making a ton of money and saw a market for graffiti so he got into that i went and covered an old school event at the gallery and you know it was three floors it was the first level street level then there was a basement and then there was a sub basement that used to that went out under the street and it used to be a speakeasy so there's three levels. So I'm down like in the fucking speakeasy under the underground New York fucking art gallery, smoking weed with the fucking owner of this gallery. And he, you know, I'm talking to him about what I do. And I'm like, yeah, man, I can't really afford to be in the studio. It's really expensive. I'm, you know, I'm trying to get this project off the ground. He's like, oh shit, man, you can look at all this room I have here. I have three floors. Like you can, you can broadcast your show from here. And um, he's like, you broadcast your show from here and help me market my gallery and we'll do it. We'll do a trade. I'm like, all right, that's fucking that works works. for me. <laughs> Let's go. And this is in Tribeca. This isn't like Tribeca. I don't know if you know Tribeca. Like the neighbors are like um, Robert De Niro, fucking David Blaine. Like it's a really high end area. So for me to have a, for me to have this guy access, you know, a key to this gallery to do my show out of now, like fucking now it's even better. Fuck Diddy's studio. I don't need that shit. They're just charging me anyway. He doesn't have anything to fucking do with it. So I moved into this gallery. And I was like, you know, just trying to figure out ways to market the gallery and uh, wound up doing this event called the Urban Arts Show at this gallery. It was a three day. The first one was a fucking three day event. It was a break dancing competition, graffiti art exhibit. We had live performances and then we had a, like a streetwear fashion show. We had a bunch of like vendors from like G-Shock, um, a bunch of other smaller like you know, brands. But like G-Shock was there. We got product from uh, Red Bull, Kid Robot. A um, bunch of like really, you know, brands that a lot of people are familiar with. Uh, Arizona Iced Tea sent us product. Like, so it was, it was a pretty successful event. And um, I had Ron G, DJ Ron G. I can't forget to mention him. I mean, Ron G, you know, he's produced records for Biggie, Tupac, um, Big L, uh, Michael Jackson, R. Kelly. Uh, Ron G is like, he's BET's number 30 most influential DJ of all time. Um, and you probably heard Biggie say peace to Ron G, Brucey B, Kid Capri in the song Juicy. He's shutting out all the New York DJs. Yeah. So like Ron G is like a fucking legendary New York DJ. So that's my homie. And I got him to uh, to be the DJ for all of the urban art shows, like move that first one and then all of them moving forward. We outgrew the gallery 
And uh, I did. I wound up doing one on a on this party boat. They call it a yacht, but I, it's more of a party boat. I don't know why they think it's a fucking yacht, but it's a party boat. And when uh, you're on a boat, you know, and you're drunk, <coughs> anything seems like a yacht. You know what I mean? It's like. Right. Uh, so the first first one I did outside of the gallery was on a what was it called the Jewel Yacht? So it was on the Jewel Yacht in uh, the West um, River of Manhattan. It went around the Statue of Liberty under the Brooklyn Bridge. So we did a graffiti art exhibit, breakdancing competition. We had some performances. That shit was super dope. And then I did one at this cocktail lounge in the Lower East Side, and I did a, a bunch of other little smaller pop ups. I did one in Denver. I fucked up um, not really scouting the venue in Denver properly and. Um, the sound system was really shitty and their air, the air condition wasn't working properly and it was the summertime. So my reputation in Denver for the event kind of got like a little fucked. So I kind of got discouraged and, you know, stopped really doing it. And it was like, it was a lot of work. I was like, fuck, this is a lot of work. So, I mean, I was making decent money, but it wasn't like, wasn't like, you know, anything to fucking beat, you know, right home about, so to speak. The Benz is in, uh, in Hollywood Hills money then, right? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, so I wound up, you know, kind of back up a little bit. So the it's, I won't go down to the story of what happened at the gallery. I'll tell you about that another time, but cause it's really crazy, but I left my, I left it's the really gallery. Crazy. I mean, come on, good, crazy or bad, crazy. All right. I'll tell you then. <laughs> Fuck it. Three, two, one, two, ignition, lift off. We at Calican are passionate about cannabis and CBD marketing, branding, SEO content, and web design. If you are a cannabis owner and you know you need an uptick in business or an upgrade in the way your customers perceive you, come check us out at calican.com and schedule a time to speak with us today. So what happened at the gallery, um, so we rented out the gallery a lot to like other people to do their own exhibits. Like if you wanted to like have your own art exhibit or your own event, you could sublet the space. Um, from us but we didn't own the space the landlord owned the space obviously so we were doing these sublets that were I guess not technically above the board um, but I mean it was an art gallery so of course we're going to rent the space to artists but what happened was um, the guys who were building the mosque across the street from the World Trade Center needed a place to uh, the Tribeca is like very close to the World Trade Center so the guy they found um, our listing for a sub rent sublet and um the developers of the mosque were using the gallery. They were paid us like an absurd amount of money. Like I think it was like 15 or 20 grand a month. I think the rent was only like 7,500 bucks a month or something there. So we were making a ton of profit off of this rental. And not even have, we didn't have to show up. We, we were making money. So um, it was like a three month thing, but the New York, the New York Post, I'll send you the article. The New York Post got a wind of the sub, the guys who were there, and obviously it's a lot of controversy that the you know, the mosque developers are having a prayer center close to the World Trade Center now, and they're trying to build the mosque. So, like, obviously people are fucking crazy, and uh, there's protesters and New York Post and all these things. So, needless to say, the landlord found out and ended the lease at the gallery. So we had a pretty good run, but uh, but yeah, I mean, we were featured in like Huffington Post, World News, like one of the top places to see see and buy graffiti in new york i mean we, we went to art basel and did pop-ups we had a good run there but i didn't make the decision to rent the to those people but um yeah ultimately that was kind of like the the nail in the coffin of the gallery world for me <laughs> i was gonna move to um, denver and actually open up a open up like a limited edition like sneaker store art gallery i found a couple locations but i was in a really toxic relationship um when I moved here with basically with her, her job uh, kind of covered the cost to move out here and the relationship was just terrible. So needless to say, I, I uh, you know, had to move once again, not only um, from with her across country, but I moved uh, like probably five weeks after moving to Denver, been pretty much in the place I'm in now. So I've been, uh, you know, been doing a lot of stuff here in Denver with, you know, the, I did one urban art show and I was like, you know, this sucks. I'm so tired of like having to fucking bust my ass to sell sponsorships and like and produce the event. Everybody, no, you're, you're never going to, in events, you're never going to please everybody. Like never. It's just never, it's just not it's possible. possible, right? <laughs> it's crazy. So it's hard to vote. And like, sometimes like, you know, people are, you know, they want to fucking attack me or talk shit. Like one guy said, we ruined his gallery and in, in Brooklyn from doing an event. It was just like, dude, we told you we were going to hang stuff on the walls. Like, what did you think was going to happen? Like, 
Um, it's an art gallery. And uh, so anyway, there was a couple of issues. I was like, you know, I'm so fucking tired of this. I need to figure out something else to do. So I was selling um, vendor spaces and sponsorships for other people's events. So I worked on like after parties for the X Games and Aspen, worked for uh, like the 420 Festival that happens in Civic Center Park in downtown Denver, did a, what was I, Denver Fashion Week. Um, so did a bunch of like really cool events here in town and uh, made a lot of connections and Eventually, I wound up uh, meeting with Danny Schaefer, who uh, actually back it up a little bit. I'm, um, before I even got to Denver, I looked at this venue called Cluster Studios, which was where uh, my 420 Tours offices was located. But Danny's partner at the time, J.J. Walker, um, he was kind of handling a lot of the events and the marketing. And um, Him and I couldn't really connect to uh, bring anything to life. They were doing a, an event called World Cannabis Week, and I wanted to plug in my urban art show um, you know, inside of the World Cannabis Week and Mike Vargas, who owned Cluster, was trying to make that happen, but um, unfortunately uh, it didn't. So fast forward a little bit um, after I was working in some of these other events and um, connected with Danny, uh, we tried to um, work together um, at one point, but I was just not um, not in a good place mentally to, you know, bring anything of like value to the team. I thought I was like, you know, bigger than I, bigger than I, my britches, so to speak. But so fast forward a little bit, I, um, I wound up having surgery on my ureter. I had scar tissue removed from like blocking urine flow from my kidney to my bladder. And I was like really humbled. Uh, wasn't able to make it, you know, much money for a few months. I was like kind of laid up and I was like, yo, Danny, um, I'm, you know, I'm ready to work. Uh, you know, what can we do? And he, you know, he's super cool dude. Um, you know, we're still very close to this day. He's like, all right, uh, let's have a meeting. So we had a meeting, met with like his um, kind of right-hand man and uh, Matt Rowland and, you know, Matt kind of gave me the blessing and kind of joined their team. And I was doing a lot of uh, kind of brand activation, putting, you know, brands in menus for different classes, tours and experiences, and even help them create a couple of the new experiences. I found a brewery um, to add into their buds and beers tour. I put together, uh, not internet really put together, but I found a candy factory called Hammond's Candy Factory where they uh, would go tour the candy factory, have like a candy making class, hop on a tour bus, go to a dispensary, smoke on the bus. So it was kind of like a different experiences than they were already running. It was kind of, you know, plugging them into tours that were already happening rather than like creating things from scratch. Mm -hmm. So I did a couple of those and then I kind of, uh, Kind of had an issue with one of the dispensary partners and i kind of uh was spending like a lot of money at the dispensary and kind of like butted heads with one of the managers there and ultimately i was just like not ready to like back down and you know danny and i were like you know let's just maintain our friendship this you know this probably isn't like an environment for me to work i'm just i've never really had the employee mindset honestly like working with him there was like the first time i ever had like an office like i was inside of an office for like you know, since I worked at the, you know, like the Examiner newspaper in like 2005 or 2006. So I, I was, you know, like the whole office dynamics and politics and like fucking it's hierarchy. Tough, you know, I mean, <laughs> going into that kind of scene when it, I mean, I swore that kind of life off a long time ago, you know what I mean? Because it's just, uh, especially like you were saying, have that kind of mindset. And people are, it's great for some people. And, you know, sometimes I had to humble myself down and be like, all right, man, like, just go do this, you know, but ultimately entrepreneurship, you know, business owner, that's uh, just feels fits the vibe much better, you know, I mean, just for, for myself and for a lot of people I know, you know, so. Yeah, totally, man. For me too. And like, you know, Danny would probably be the only person I would ever consider working for. Even again, like now, I mean, even since that happened, I've, I've had a lot of like kind of, you know, growth. Um, but, you know, I would, I don't think I could ever work for anybody, um, you know, unless it would be somebody like Danny who understands me and who's a friend, but, but yeah, so we separated and I kind of, uh, you know, I kind of like, that was like, you know, last, what was that, like September of 2019? So I was still working on Denver Fashion Week and I had X Games. I was doing product placement for it. So I still had other things going on. So I wasn't like totally like, you know, like unemployed, but um, but I just wasn't working with in the office with my 420 tour just because I just, I can't fucking be in an office. Danny said something to me one day. He's like, oh yeah, I get it, man. You can't keep a, you can't keep a Lamborghini parked. It was just his way of trying to like fucking stroke my ego, but but uh but yeah that's pretty good, good that that's, that's a good line actually <laughs> yeah so and then you know so so um so yeah then uh fast forward that was like a year ago x games was literally a year ago and um that was the last concert that was the last event that i worked on well and that's not true um at the saint patrick's day um festival here in denver i sold a couple of vendor booths for that which i actually still have to refund to the event producer who uh 
who, yeah, I mean, they've been really kind and, and, you know, generous while I've, you know, kind of been building my company from the ground up. But yeah, that reminds me, I have to, you know, refund some vendor spaces to the event producer that I got, because I got not, not the vendor spaces, but my commissions that I got paid, so to speak. Um, Cause I got, you know, that's how I was making money. I was selling vendor spaces or sponsorships. So I have to refund uh, my commissions. And yeah, so that was the last event I worked on. And then, like I said, I, I, uh, one of my jobs in college, I worked at a golf course. So I tried doing some work at a, at a golf course here in town. And I was like, you know, fuck this shit. I'm too old to be out here at fucking five in the morning trying to fucking rake bunkers. Like what the fuck am I even thinking? But I had no income. So I was like, I needed to do something. It was like the next thing that I considered being enjoyable, like being out on a golf course. So then uh, I wound up white labeling some, uh, some geofencing services to our local grocery store here, King Supers, Kroger. So I did a, uh, did some white labeling for their click list program um, for their geo for some geofencing. And that was pretty cool, but they, um, they brought that um, kind of marketing strategies and things in-house. And I just didn't really want to uh, work at, you know, in, in-house at Kroger. So, um, so yeah, so then I came up with the idea to start this website, bloomberryjane.com. And that's kind of where we're at now. It's kind of a long winded story, but that's kind of how I got here. No, I mean, amazing. You know, what's cool, man, is that it's, you know, when you hear a story, you know, we can take bits and pieces of something and try and make sense of it, right? But like when you hear a story, you can really hear the progression to see how a person got somewhere, why they're interested in certain things. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, slang and bed from uh, early age and all that stuff. I mean, that's how I got into the uh, industry myself too. You know what I mean? Back uh, in 2002. But then hearing the progression then to, uh, to media, to ad buys, you know, working your way up and then, you know, being thrust onto the, uh, onto the airwaves, right? You know, they're like, oh, dude, you'd be pretty good on here, right? And then crazy. There, you know, going on tour, um, you know, going in uh, graffiti and, and everything. It's kind of like you got the whole, uh, you got the, uh, the hip hop thing down, you know, you got the hip hop, yeah, I mean, the six tapes, the graffiti, the cannabis, the everything, bro. You know, it's like. Uh, nobody can like question my love and like even the foot, like I've fucking walked through Marcy projects. Like I've been fucking, I've lived in Bed-Stuy on Pulaski and Nostrum Avenue. I grew up in the inner city of Baltimore, which isn't really much hip hop, but like I'm, uh, I'm, I've lived a very diverse life. Like, I mean, not to go too much into uh, some dirt, but I mean, I've, I tell people I've been everywhere from inside of solitary confinement in jail and I've been in fucking private jets. So and, and everywhere in between. So, I mean, I have a pretty different perspective than most people. No, definitely. I mean, it kind of takes that way to be successful in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? Having that dessert, that diverse mindset. Um, but you can see like, sometimes it's a, it's a thin line, right? You know, you talk about people, um, you see like the people who, are uh, the biggest visionaries in the world, the biggest billionaires in the world. And if, sometimes you can look at them and say, if that was all taken away, maybe these guys would be, uh, you know, be considered nuts, right? But it's not, it's just eccentric, right? There's certain things that bring people, bring these visions to the forefront, you know, that's something uh, that you have, you know? So it's, 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 it's cool now, Blue Mary Jane. So talk to me about Blue Mary Jane then. Talk to me about, you know, this, this venture that you have here, um, you know, Tell me yeah. what led up to it. Talk to me about the vision now and the goal for it now. So the vision is like, you know, kind of like a, honestly, it was really something that started as like just to simulate my brain. And like, I always like creating content. I've been able to get a lot of access to events through creating content. Um, you know, I mean, I, there's, I have a whole fucking drawer full of lanyards from, you know, really amazing events and, um, you know, creating content for media outlets, whether it be audio, video, photography. Um, I'm not a, a photographer. I don't do that stuff myself, but I kind of um, produce it all. So I like, I like producing content and, um, and, you know, so that's kind of like my, really my passion, I would say, like connecting people um, it would be close second, but yeah. So I always worked in a lot of events. And then I had the, you know, international-hiphop.com site that, you know, I sold. So I, I had some success in running a, a blog in the past. And I really, I really believe that my network in Denver is pretty strong. I mean, you know, Rhett from Native Roots, who's the founder of Native Roots, who I, I don't know how many they have now, probably 20 dispensaries or, you know, they're, they're huge. He's, they have a 200,000 square foot grow. And, you know, he's somebody who, you know, I have a relationship with and then Danny Schaefer, the CEO of my 420 tours is one of my closest friends. We just went skydiving, um, you know, a couple months ago, or I guess like a month and a half ago. I mean, that sounds dope. Oh yeah. It was crazy. We ate some mushrooms. Your first time. Of- Holy shit. Mushrooms <laughs> skydiving. Yeah. It was a little intense for me. He said it was good. He didn't need as many as I, as many mushrooms as I did, but, 
but yeah, we jumped out of a plane. So yeah, you ever done that before, cool. or was that the first time? No, that was the first oh, time. I wanted to do it for like yeah. a year and a half. Nobody That's would go with me, and then he sold his house, and he was like, "All right, I'm I'm down to go now." And uh, yeah, it was, I was trying to go for my birthday like a year and a half ago. So he like treated me for my birthday because I was like always staying persistent. I'm like, yo, what the fuck? Let's go skydiving. So it was pretty cool. And there's a video on my Instagram, um, you know, at Strategic Scott. I mean, that's, if, pretty uh, that's pretty dope. That's pretty Yeah. I mean, that's another thing too, right? Strategic Scott, right? I, I, I think we first connected on Clubhouse, right? And then we uh, moved it off onto Instagram and stuff. But this is it, right? This is the handle, Strategic Scott. Talk to me. What is uh, the idea behind Strategic Scott? You know, honestly, there was this uh, company um, in uh, in L.A. that I was working. It was like a PR company called Talk Fusion. And all of their emails from everybody who worked there was like, talk Ken, talk Tracy, talk whoever. So I was like, oh, OK, I like I like how that. Yeah, I like that. And then so I started calling when I was working at Convict. I was like, all right, I'll be Convict Scott. And um, <laughs> yeah, so I started doing that. And then I was like, you know, then I worked. I had a company, Elevated uh, Entertainment Solutions. So then I was Elevated Scott for a while. Um, and yeah, now I'm just like, kind of, I wouldn't say success, but you know, I guess success is more of a journey, not really a destination. It sort of sure. sounds kind of cheesy, Always. but I believe that. So I think like adding value, leveraging relationships, breaking rules, having fun. Um, I think those are really kind of important killer pillars in, a you know, kind of navigating that journey. And, uh, I think, you know, being strategic and, and, and that, and, you know, not being intimidated by somebody's success and, and, and networking, wanting to network with them or, or just kind of like, a, you know, sometimes like, you know, instead of knocking on the front door for opportunities, you know, go around the back. A lot of time the back door, people leave it unlocked. So just kind of like being a, being strategic in ways to build relationships and, and add value, break the rules and, and, you know, have fun. 100%. I believe that too. You know, it's uh when the, I like the adage, you know, when a door closes, the window opens, but really, you know, there's always a door to go into, you know, and sometimes that's uh, the best way anyways, you know, I always remember, uh, what was it, uh, Goodfellas, right, where the dude knows all the, uh, the doormen, and, you know, they walk them down, they escort them through the back, you know, give right. them up in the front, you know, it's like, uh, knowing the gatekeepers, you know, that's the best way a lot of times to get stuff done, you know, we can go up to the top and everything, and, and, uh, which is cool, yeah. too, right, but uh, it's been amazing. the get shit done. Yeah, like for instance, like, you know, I'm going to be doing some affiliate marketing work with uh, Greenlane. Greenlane's the world's largest distributor. They have offices in Amsterdam, New York, LA. I mean, they, they distribute PAX, um, uh, Puff, I think Puffco, a bunch of really, all the top brands. They distribute everybody. Vibes Papers, um, they own Vapor.com. So I met the owner, um, founder on Clubhouse. And like, you know, he, we connected and he, uh, he connected me with his director of marketing. So like having, you know, instead of me having to like fucking find my way up through the, through the chain of command, so to speak, I got the CEO to introduce me to his people. So it was like, you know, coming from the top down, it's much easier to kind of like, you know, navigate uh, those relationships. Yep. Yeah, man. So that's, the, that's what strategic's all about, baby. You got to be strategic, baby. You got to, got to make your way in there and tell me, I mean, like I said, we connect on clubhouse, Dude, talk to me about Clubhouse, right? I mean, this has been amazing so far. It's, you know, it's just, uh, you know, just it's good and bad. relationships, you know, meeting people and uh, connecting, you know, in different ways, right? Yeah, it's been really time consuming. At first, I kind of like on Clubhouse. I got, I, how long have you been on Clubhouse? When did you get on? Uh, about three weeks ago, something like that. Like at the beginning of the year. Gotcha. So like right around the same time I got on. I got on like the end of like- I gotta, I gotta watch myself. I mean, I, I gotta go on there and just- do what I got to do. Otherwise you're right. Right. It's easy to like, for Dude, time consuming and everything. So what happens is, like when I first got on, I, I was like, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I was a club promoter. I was, I fucking, I'm a hustler. So I like, I wanted to be everywhere. I wanted to like fucking blah, 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 blah. Like, and you know, realizing that it's like, it's not the way to move. Like you can't move like that. Every, everything's not for everybody and, and everybody's not going to be like receptive to, I have a very like intense personality. So like everybody's not going to be receptive to, to my style of communication. Some people are, some people like it. Um, so it's just about finding your kind of your, uh, your tribe or your crew um, or your club, so to speak on clubhouse. And um, yeah, just tap in with the people that are talking. And yeah, I've had some really good success. I, we, I met a uh, Matt Seibert and, and his partner, Aaron. Um, we've been, you know, I've been kind of helping them uh, moderate the uh, cannabis e-commerce room, which 
was incredible. We had Gary V pop into our room for like 45 minutes and we had a conversation with Gary V. Um, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It like opens up doors that like, you know, when you're going to ever have a conversation with Gary V, you know, <laughs> but that was crazy. I've been watching that guy's content for years. And yeah. Now I'm like, I'm having, I'm talking to him just like we're talking right now. Yeah. yeah. Like, it was wild. So, um, and I, you know, I worked, I was on fucking tour for a year and a half. Like I don't get fucking starstruck, but yeah, yeah, I was exactly. like, damn, I was like, damn, this is pretty fucking cool. Like I was like, I was like, cool. This is what this, like, I was excited. Um, so yeah, um, that happened. And then, uh, I got, a. You know, doing this with you, like we're doing the YouTubers, bloggers, and podcasters pull up cross promo. Like, you know, instead of spending money on advertising, we're you know trying to build a community of you know I'm going to interview you on my site, and you know we're doing this podcast now. So like, instead of paying for advertising, we're doing cross promotion with you know. So that's been really. I think I've this is the second one I've done. I think at this point I've booked myself on maybe eight podcasts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's been pretty cool to like you know um, tell my story. And, uh, you know, I'm going to try to keep all of them different. Like, I'm not going to, you know, probably tell it. Like, you just got, like, some juicy fucking details. Like, yeah, dude. I, I mean, I, it's the story's never been, re- right? it's never been recorded cool. anywhere. The story that I just told you has, like, never been recorded anywhere. So hopefully uh, hopefully people will, um, you know, a lot of my friends have heard it. But, you know, I think I have a, I think I have a pretty interesting journey. So, I mean, in my yeah, I mean, and I appreciate that, you know, because that's what we're trying to do here, you know, is dank discussions, right? I mean, I, I can sit here and have, like, an interview questionnaire question list and go down the whole thing but it's just not a i love the realness you know i love keeping it real and uh, you know having that kind of that flow you know keeping it candid and everything you know so that's the most important thing you know on that note too you know you're talking about success right and success cheesy this that the other thing you know one thing i do ask everybody on the show i you know the one question that i do always get to because to me that's the most fascinating thing right because you meet people from all walks of life you meet people who who have uh, achieved success in different ways, right? But everybody has a different way of looking at success. So how do you define success, right? Whether professionally, personally, spiritually, what is success like for you? I mean, for me, it's like, I think, I don't know who I heard say it. Maybe it was Mark Cuban or somebody, I don't know. But time, I think time is like really uh, like the freedom, you know, of time uh, is because you can't buy time. Um, so I think that is probably like, you know, my success um, definition would be, um, you know, not only financial freedom, but, you know, just time, having time to do whatever you want to do, whether that's, you know, go have a fucking cheeseburger, go watch your kid's soccer game. I don't have any kids, but, you know, for people who do, um, you know, just having time to do the things that you want to do and not being forced to show up to an office, like not being forced to go to a meeting, just, you know, really spending the times uh, on things that you're passionate and things that you love. So, just, you know, just really having a, having your time. Amazing. Amazing. No, definitely. So, I mean, we talked about the past. We talked about what's, you know, what, what we have coming up. What are you talking about the future of Blue Mary Jane? You know, where do you see this thing going? Um, you know, we talked about the vision a little bit, but uh, what do you guys have coming up specifically plan? Um, yeah, man. So right now we just actually, um, th- like I said, the, the blog started as just something to stimulate my brain and clubhouse has been really helpful to kind of like drive awareness to the site and, and kind of what we're doing. I, I dropped some, uh, CBD bath bombs that I, I white labeled. I built a, oh, this is audio. So I was going to show you the box, but I got this like, you know, blue box. It's kind of like a Tiffany's, uh, colorway. Um, the top is blue too, but yeah, so we have these, uh, blue boxes that, uh, we put out these, a lot of people who do these CBD bath bombs, they just put them in a, in like bags and um i found putting them in this box people it's like you know people remember that tiffany's blue box like it was yeah. you know, that was a thing so like I, I obviously we're not using the same pantone because tiffany owns that colorway but we got pretty damn close and um so you know i call it the new blue box so we put these bath bombs we got eucalyptus fresh cut roses and lavender literally while we're on this podcast right now i mean i, I can do it i can i'll show you just so you don't think i'm bullshitting you some girl um is saying uh, can you read that yeah, yeah. Like I said, the big dog jumped on me and pushed me down. Oh, she, she's saying, can I order online? She's talking oh. about the bath bombs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like people, like this is this, that was a one, that was 11, 13, it's 11, 18 now. So like, you know, fucking people are ordering these things, dude. Like every, all my friends, people that like, you know, even, that I don't even know that well, like people are supporting him. So it's been pretty cool to see. It was just a product that I started to, you know, kind of test the market. I was going to promote the use it to send to influencers and media outlets to kind of promote the website, mm-hmm. but people were, people are buying them. So I was like, you know, there's something, we have something here. I love that one, man. The bad ones. So yeah. So, 
So yeah, so I have an investor. Um, you know, I, I uh, gave him a percentage of, uh, of product sales. So we did the bath bombs, and now we're launching our uh, CBD face skincare face mask. I'm going to be cranberry, bamboo, ten milligrams, and uh, yeah, it's called Flora Cura, which means uh, bloom care in Latin. And uh, our bath bombs, we call them bloom bombs. Um, yeah, so we're just trying to uh, build out. You know, some, it's just white label right now. I'm not sure if we will get in, any, into any like custom formulations, but you know, we're we're working um, uh, with a guy named Morgan Kling on some like high level influencer marketing campaign activations, and then also I'm getting into the CBD business accelerator. So there's you know kind of working on these influencer marketing campaigns and. The CBD Business Accelerator has, you know, literally the world's best experts on CBD compliance, uh, advertising, all the things that you need to know um, to grow and scale and sell your CBD company if you want to exit. Um, so, yeah, there's, there's that. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm working on the next few days. I'm going to be um, kind of starting the CBD Business Accelerator courses and um, kind of building out the framework for our influencer marketing campaigns where more or less we're going to be having affiliates as influencers, like more micro influencers, not like someone who has 10 million followers, but, you know, maybe someone who has 15,000 followers, we'll make them an affiliate. And we'll, what that means is we'll give them a unique promo code, a unique link, and they'll be able to, uh, to sell product of ours uh, without carrying any inventory themselves. And they'll earn a commission off of any sales they'll generate. And then we'll also seed them products. So, you know, we'll gift them um, product uh, as, you know, as accordingly, if they're, you know, high performing um, sales, we'll obviously send them more product, but if they're, you know, not moving high volumes, we'll probably just send them smaller amounts. But yeah, so that's kind of what I'm working on now, the affiliate marketing with the influencers and building out the terms and framework of that. Amazing. Amazing. A lot of exciting stuff, man. Yeah. People love those, those bath bombs and uh, you know, it's all about progression, right? You know, little by little, you know, you do the white labeling, then you get to the custom if you want and whatever else, but at least you get to get some market research in. Um, it sounds like you're doing it the right way with the, uh, yeah, I got lucky, that, you know, our writer, uh, actually, I can't even take credit for like coming up with the idea. I have to shout out our writer, Lacey. Um, you know, she's been a uh, really kind of helpful, not only, you know, writing a couple articles on the website, but I was telling her that I wanted to white label some CBD products. And she's like, you know what, you should do bath bombs. I'm like, you know what, sounds like a good idea, Lacey. So, uh, so yeah, so we did. And then my buddy, uh, Matt Rowland just started working in a contract manufacturing facility. And I know the, some of the brands that they produce because I, they, I sold them sponsorships before and people fucking love these face masks. They literally, they love them. And they, they didn't make them for a while. And then I was like, oh, you guys can white label them? Fuck yeah, I'll white label some face masks. I already know the demand is there. So we're going to be releasing them um, beginning of uh, February with the cranberry bamboo 10 milligram um, one. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. I've already, I already have pre-orders. We don't even, um, yes, I mean, we've already sold pre, like I think 19 or no, nine pre-orders uh, of that product. And um, yeah, we're going to be adding oat milk and honey, hundred milligram bath bomb to the, to the lineup for the bloom bombs. And yeah, pretty, uh, pretty stoked for these products, man. Like I don't fucking knew, I never knew I'd be selling CBD products, but I'm, people are responding really well to, uh, to them and, and buying them. And, uh, so I'm, I'm hoping to really scale up and, and make a, you know, make a nice living, um, you know, doing this and figuring out ways to give back. I mean, I, I spent time living in, in group homes and I, uh, I've been on the board of directors for uh, the Brooklyn lacrosse club, which, um, you know, so just finding ways to give back to, you know, whether it be lacrosse organizations mm -hmm. or, you know, different, um, you know, child uh, care organizations. I, I lived at the board of child care in Baltimore. So, you know, figuring out, folks that, you know, I'm not there yet, but I would give back. Um, I have done a lot of like sponsorship. I worked with a flight to luxury event here and raised money, like finding things for their silent auction. So I've done some like things, not myself raising money. I'm, I'm actually one of the biggest things I'm, I'm focused on now, not only with these products in my site, but I'm actually fighting uh, Danny Schaefer, who I mentioned in my 420 tours. I watched him uh, compete in Haymakers for Hope, which is an organization. They have fights in uh, Boston, New York, D.C., and Denver. So they're in four cities, you know, huge production charity boxing event. Um, you know, you would think it's, you know, professional fight night, the way they produce this event. And, um, 
you train for like four months at a you know professional boxing gym and get all the coaching and training you need. And you can, uh, you're raising money for, to, to be a part of the event, you have to commit to raising $7,500 for uh, a charity. The charity I was um, doing it, Danny won his fight. I signed up to do it in uh, 2020, obviously COVID to happen. So they postponed it. So I'm going to be starting training again for Haymakers for Hope and raising money for a, uh, for a uh, family, I can't remember the name of the organization. I have um, Family First, I think. Let me just make sure. But but uh, but yeah, so I'm raising money for an organization. What they do is uh, Family Reach. That's what it's called. So raising money for Family Reach. Um, basically, what they do is they help families that are going through cancer treatments, and and uh, they help them with their month, whether it be a heating bill, electric bill, or even you know putting food on the table. So I'm raising money for Family Reach. Um, I think I've already raised like almost two grand um, as my for my seventy five hundred dollar goal. So yeah, so aside from like the Blue Mary Jane stuff, I'm, you know, hopefully one day I'll be able to give back proceeds to that. But Haymakers for Hope has been pretty cool to kind of, you know, I mean, it's a, it's it's like almost a second job when you're training for a fight. So I'm, I'm pretty excited to get back to training and raising money for, for Haymakers. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. It's all about giving back, you know, because like you're saying, right, especially when we know where we come from and seeing the kind of struggles we've been through and everything like that. And then, uh, you know, having opportunity now, um, you know, seeing growth in our own life and business professionally, you know, it's so important. So I love to hear that, man, for sure. Uh, yeah, it's cool. It's like, you know, I don't, I don't, uh, I wouldn't say I'm as financially successful as I'd like to be, but I have a, a lot of relationships and, you know, it's kind of corny to say, but they say your network is your net worth. So I'm, I'm pretty confident I'll be able to crush the $7,500 fundraising goal. And, and, um, and, and yeah, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I can't wait for 2020. I mean, it's literally 24 days in and, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of really solid momentum that's happening. And, and, uh, yeah, even when I move in seven days, it's going to be even more of a peace of mind. So I'm, uh, yeah, can't wait to see what's next. Love it, man. Love it. Well, you know, as we close, as we wind down, how can listeners find out more about you, find out more about uh, Blue Mary Jane, everything you guys are doing, everything that you're doing and connect with you. Uh, I mean, the easiest way is, um, you know, the website, bloommaryjane.com. Um, you can also check out uh, social media, Bloom underscore Mary Jane uh, on Instagram. Uh, my personals are uh, Strategic Scott on Instagram, uh, on Twitter at uh, Strategic underscore Scott. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty much uh, pretty much available. Um, I, right now, my main focus is just you know finding uh, you know creatives to to feature on the blog as far as like whether a filmmaker, a musician to let them tell their creative story on how they use cannabis. And obviously we're going to be going uh, all legal markets, finding products to review. So if you guys have legal products and legal markets for cannabis, definitely, um, you know, shoot us an email info at bloommaryjane.com. Um, and it'll get to me somehow, some way through the wizardy wizardry of the internet. And <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm, that's pretty much what I'm doing. And uh, I'm going to do your interview, actually work on your questions today. And uh, yeah, just continue to hustle on Clubhouse and build relationships and hopefully events come back and I'll be able to uh, sell some event sponsorships because I really, I really, uh, I really enjoyed, um, you know, attending events and, and being able to connect sponsors with um, exciting experiential marketing activities where, you know, they can see their brand grow and profit. I love it, man. This is definitely something we miss, you know, the events. Um, but uh, slowly but surely, it seems like I'm coming back around because it's definitely something that everybody's missing for sure, man. So, uh, Scott, man, I appreciate it. Strategic, strategic Scott. It's been, it's been great reconnecting. Yeah, no doubt. How long have we been talking here? I feel like we've been yeah, here man, for a while. It's been a minute now already, dude. It's been like an hour and 20, I think, something like that. Yeah, like a Joe Rogan. We've got to go for like three hours. Yeah, now. exactly, <laughs> exactly. I get off of here. But, so is this whole, this whole recording will be put out? Yeah, yeah. I mean, usually we do. I mean, this will be edited now, this little bit. But, right. Uh, yeah. But the whole damn, that's cool. That's yeah, yeah. yeah, nobody's ever heard that story like on recording. So I'm excited to put like I'll promote the shit out of it because you know, I I'm it's been a fucking roller coaster, but I've had some cool cool experiences. Dude, I mean, you know, we talk about net worth and all this stuff. All that stuff's uh, ridiculous, anyways. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, we have our experiences, we have our life, and uh, and all that stuff. You know, it comes and goes, as you know. It's up and downs. You know, so where, you know, uh, characters built when the chips are down, you know, all these cliches, but they really do mean something, you know? So, um, you know, I appreciate you. Oh, yeah. Uh, thanks yeah, no for having us today. Yeah, and thank I you. Look to you the rest of uh, the year and beyond. Yeah, no doubt, man. I'm sure we'll be in touch. Oh. 
Thanks for listening to Dank Discussions. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. Please make sure you subscribe and leave a review. We want to continue making dank content you want to hear, so give us some feedback about the topics you want covered. Feel free to reach out to us at grow at calican.com. That's G-R-O-W at C-A-L-A-C-A-N-N dot com. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter for our latest updates.